In, in Corvallis, and we've been in the, over the last four or five years, um, we've we've had a pretty intensive effort on the Delta here, looking at uh, the potential effects of climate change and what it might mean to fish and aquatic invertebrates um, on the Delta. So um, this has been a, 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 a um, an effort that's involved a lot of people from a number of different universities. Um, uh, both back east and here on the west coast, and then a number of some people from NGOs like Lee Bend at Earth Systems Institute, uh, folks from over in Anchorage, Chris Zimmerman, uh, and so it's been a, a real collaborative effort. Everybody's pitched in. We've had very little money to do this. Uh, it, it's really been a labor of love. Uh, we've gotten some funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, other than that, uh, literally the universities have contributed to this. Uh, by paying for grad students to come here uh, to work. Uh, we've gotten a little bit of money from the, from the, uh, the research station. We've got a tremendous amount of, of, of uh, in-kind contribution from the district. Uh, but uh, we've, got, we've been able to do a lot, I think, on, on relatively little uh, um, funding. So the, the project that we're working on uh, started off, we were working on, on pond ecology and looking at aquatic invertebrates in the ponds. Uh, across the delta, and then we started looking at the interaction between aquatic invertebrates and birds, and, try, and, and trying to look at that relationship. And then on, on the fish, this is uh, in the last couple of years, what we've started doing, and I'll show you some, uh, some of the data here, uh, looking at thermal regimes of streams. Now we've, we've got 16, 17 streams now systemed on the delta that we've monitored somewhere between two and five years, year long. So we're looking at the at, at the temperatures um, in the system the, uh, across the entire year. Uh, we're starting to look at, at, at life history diversity and then some of the egg features and looking at that. So I'll just quickly run through some of these major findings that we've had so far. Okay, um, the pond work is probably uh, the most uh, intensive part of this so far. Um, you know, you guys are familiar with this, being around here, we got the uplifted marsh, which was in, uh, came up in the 64 earthquake, and the, then the outwashed plain, which is the, the fed by glaciers. When we far, first started this project, we had no idea what we were going to find. I mean, one of the interesting things about this area is from a zoogeographic perspective, it's really um, depauperant in terms of fauna. And when you think about it, uh, it doesn't have much in terms of diversity. Um, you got the mountains on one side, and the copper, and then you got the Gulf of Alaska. And, and from a, from the perspective of of um, zoogeography, it's a pretty um, not a very diverse place, but it's very productive. Uh, and we've had people who have worked all over the world, entomologists who have worked all over the world, and they they claim they've never seen anything like this, in terms of how um, the, with low diversity but incredible productivity. And so what we've seen is um, that basically the, um, the ponds on the different uh, parts of the delta really are quite different. Um, the outwash plain ponds, if you ever noticed, they've got the, that orangish reddish tint to them. It turns out what that is, it, it, it's uh, groundwater that's coming from an anaerobic condition and it's glacial groundwater. And as they come from an oxygen deprived environment to one that has oxygen, the, the iron begins to precipitate out. And then that iron is utilized by bacteria. So that cotton candy mat you see is actually an, uh, a bacterial flock that's in the, um, uh, actually extend into the water column. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that. That's really important ecologically uh, in terms of what happened in these ponds. And then we look out on the uplifted marsh and you don't see that, okay? And one of the reasons is we've got these fine sediments that primarily block any groundwater from moving into those ponds. So here you've got this coarser substrate with the groundwater coming in. Here you've got this fine sediment to prevent it. And it turns out that ecologically that's really um, quite significant because when you look at the uh, uplifted marshes, the, the ponds and the uplifted marsh are very, very different than the outwashed plains.
And what you see here is just a schematic trying to illustrate uh, what type of diversity you see within these, uh, in these ponds. And what we see is, um, oops, back up here. Um, what we see is that these ponds are, are, are uh, dominated in, in both types by the corrected water boatmen. You go out there and you look, you see these things, they're just everywhere. And some form of damsel or dragonfly. Those are the main uh, components of these. But what you see in the, in the uplifted marsh pond, all parts of the pond, of, of, the, of the vegetative component, and this vegetation is very analogous to a forest. It's, it's, it's a, it, you've got a canopy, an understory, and then you've got a, a forest floor. And what you see in these ponds is all parts of that environment are used. We've got a well-developed benthic component, a lot of, you know, the midges that you see around here, they're coming from those ponds primarily. That's where the, 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 the uh, um, <coughs> you know, the noceums. That's why you got noceums, because those ponds are incredibly productive for noceums. But what's interesting is associated with these, with this substrate are these major predators, these various uh, uh, dragonflies. Uh, and then you've got in, this, uh, in the understory of this, um, uh, this, this uh, underwater forest, You've got uh, organisms that are grazers. Essentially, these caddisflies are going along grazing the algae and diatoms off of the structure of these, uh, of these plants. Just analogous to cows in some ways, okay? Uh, and then you've got a major predator, another, another type of dragonfly that's a major predator there. And then you've got these, the water boatmen and the damselfly, the, another predator that tend to be higher up in the water column. So really, uh, a, a really well-developed uh, aquatic assemblage here that's using all parts of, of the environment. And this is in contrast to what you see just on the other side of the road, literally. What you, see, what you don't see is this understory, the only part of the understory is used, and none of the forest floor is used. There are very few midges or any other organisms found associated with the um, the substrate in those ponds, They're very, it, which makes them very different than the um, uh, than what we what we see on the on the uplifted marsh. And you notice what we're also missing are the, are the are the grazers. Okay, the the big caddisfly component is missing there. Now we're not quite sure why that is. Uh, if you measure dissolved oxygen, it doesn't look like this, particularly during the summer. Um, Oxygen levels are more than sufficient to, to meet uh, biological needs. Now, we're only looking at it during the summer. It may be as, as the, uh, right now we're in a transition uh, uh, time, uh, as the plants begin to die back and fall to, the, um, fall to the bottom along with this iron flock, it may be that it becomes anaerobic. And so the winter time may be limiting the organisms that are here uh, in, in, the, um, in the bottom of, of, these, of these marshes. Uh, and so very, very different in terms of, of, it, of, the, of the structure and composition of this community. And if you look at it in terms of where the most productive ponds are, they're not in the uplift, I'm, I'm sorry, they're not on the outwash plain, they're on the uplifted marsh. And you notice where most of the birds are? The uplifted marsh, okay? And the, particularly the birds that depend on invertebrates. Uh, so you have a very, very different, uh, these, these ponds are, very, are structured very, very differently just in that short distance. So in terms of climate change, one of the, the concerns, we, uh, one of the issues we're looking into is what's going to happen to this iron flock level? Because if the glaciers begin to melt, are we going to see more groundwater? And are we going to expect that this level of iron flock is actually going to increase in these ponds? And if it does, that's going to further decrease the productivity um, of these ponds. Okay? So, when we think about climate change, most people are focused on what happened during the summer. But, one of the major impacts, of one, of, one of the potential um, changes of climate change are warmer winters. Okay? And if you look at the projections for this area, there's some of the most dramatic in Alaska. Um, you can see here, we're moving 
you know, the, the, the largest type of changes are going to be occurring along the coast here. Okay, why is that important? Okay, if you look at the development cycle of these, of, of these aquatic invertebrates, okay, basically what you see is this, these, are, these are organisms that take a year or more to develop. They're going to be the dragonflies, the caddisflies. Um, they take, they, they, they basically, the, the adults emerge in June and July, they lay their eggs, and they develop and emerge again back in May and June, okay? Now, what's important here is this development is entirely dependent on the accumulation of heat. Okay, these organisms have to accumulate heat in order to develop. And the heat is, is measured in what we call degree days. It's an, if, so one degree day is if you have water that's one degree above zero on the centigrade scale, that's one degree day, okay? So you have to accumulate something in the neighborhood of 350 to 400 degree days for these insects to complete their life cycle. Okay, so think about what we have here. We have very relatively cold winters, so it's relatively small change in the winter temperatures is going to mean that degree days are actually going to accumulate much more quickly than what they normally do. And so what we see is if you just do some back of the envelope calculations and add one degree centigrade to the winter temperatures, what it means is that these insects could conceivably begin to emerge, whoops, could be conceivably begin to emerge uh, roughly a month or two early. Why is that important? It turns out that if you look at when the primary nesting and fledging of many of the birds is, it coincides exactly with the peak emergence of adult invertebrates on the delta, these aquatic invertebrates. What triggers this, the movement of these birds, is light, not temperature. So these birds are moving north into this area on light cues, not temperature cues. So one potential consequence is a desynchronization of this, because the, the invertebrates could potentially begin to emerge earlier, and you might see potential consequences to birds. In Europe, they've already seen this. There's, there's lots of examples from the, uh, in the literature uh, from Europe where this desynchronization has happened between neotropical birds and caterpillars so you, on, on the terrestrial side. So that's something that we're keeping our eye on. So in the last couple of years, we started, as we were thinking about this, we started thinking, well, what would, what, what potentially some of the ways that the delta might be able to um, uh, compensate for this? Well, if you start to look, we started looking, uh, expanding our work from the east delta, include the west delta. Uh, it turns out that the west, east delta, on average, is about one degree cooler over the course of the year than here. So if you look at what the East Delta is doing, the East Delta, it, it, if it had a one degree change, it'd be more similar to what we see here. And sure enough, it turned out that the emergence of, emergence of invertebrates on the East Delta is about a month and a half to two months later than it is on the West Delta. So one of the things you notice is where all the bird populations are right now are on the West Delta. That's because you've got the, the food, amazing food resource that is contributing to the nesting and fledging success. Uh, can you explain East and West Delta? Yeah, the, we basically break it at the copper, okay, so at, at mile 27. And so what we are seeing is, uh, you know, the potential that a one degree shift could make in, in temperatures could potentially make the East Delta look like the West Delta now. So rather than thinking that we are going to lose many of these bird populations, we may see, just simply see a redistribution of that. Now that assumes also that the habitat is, is suitable out there. But there may be ways, you know, some of the potential consequences may not be, you know, when you look at it in a limited area, it looks like it's pretty major. But when you expand and look at it across a larger area, it looks like there could be shift, shift in just in the, in the distribution of organisms on the delta towards uh, other parts. Okay. So, I want to take the same idea of, 
of degree days and temperature, and, and we want to start looking at it in terms of fish. Well, this is a, a, a graph from a, a paper that was talked about, that looked at uh, water temperature and, and fish ecology from the, back in 1999. And the key here is what you're looking at is changes in the days of emergence if you change the base temperature by one degree centigrade. So if your base temperature is somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three degrees, and you add one degree to it, you're going to change the time of emergence by 50 or 60 days, depending on the species. So again, it's this idea of accumulation of heat. Okay? You're not accumulating much heat here, but remember, if you add one degree, you're actually accumulating 50% more heat per day. Okay, so we think of these as relatively small changes, but ecologically, they're very significant. Uh, and so we've been using, we, we, we've taken this idea and we're trying to look at what this might mean to, uh, to coho and on streams um, on, the, on the delta itself. So what we've been doing is, is monitoring water temperatures, as I said, somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five years, year-round temperatures. And these are just different, uh, some examples of what we've got. Salmon Creek um, is a groundwater system. Uh, McKinley Lake, this is at the outlet of the lake near the cabin. So what you're looking at is air temperature here, surface temperatures, and then the blue, the blue is the surface temperature that these, and the red is the subsurface. So we're measuring the water temperature a couple different ways. We're actually looking at it in the water column, and then we're trying to look at it in the, in the environment that the eggs are incubating in. That's what that subsurface water temperature is. So that's somewhere 12 to 15, 18 inches below the, um, into the stream bed is what we're looking at. So you can see the very different patterns here. Uh, so if you start thinking about susceptibility, eight, something like 18 mile is probably the most susceptible in terms of its vulnerability to, uh, to change. It's a surface water system, and you can see that air temperature and water temperature really tightly are tightly coupled with each other. Okay? You look at something like Power Creek, you notice what happened. It, st it starts, it stays cold. It starts to rise and then it falls back over. That's because of the glacial influence. So if you're thinking about climate change here, this is probably going to be the first place we're going to see a, a, an impact of, of, of a potential impact of climate change. It's something like 18 mile. Power Creek is probably going to be somewhat buffered against the impact of climate change until the glaciers and the snow fields are gone. Okay? And then we have finally something like Salmon Creek, which is the groundwater system. And that's probably going to be pretty immune to climate change for, for a while, you know, unt until the, that reservoir, that ground, underground reservoir water warms up. But it's going to take a t a l probably take a, a long time to, um, in these systems for that, that to happen. So you've got Salmon Creek, 25 Mile is another example of something like this. Clear Creek is another example of, a, of, of, the, of the groundwater system that we've been, um, been looking at. So we've got, like I say, there's 16 or 17 of these sites um, distributed across the delta right now. Uh, we're hoping to be able to add more, particularly we tried to get out. This wasn't a good year to do field work, believe me. <laughs> and the fall has even been worse. Um, uh, we're trying to add more sites uh, out on the, um, on the east delta, out here off, off particularly over on in the, in the um, in tributary of, of the Dirty Martin. But now we've got a pretty comprehensive record um, that, we're, that we're establishing in terms of following uh, water temperature. Okay, so what, we, what are we going to do here? One of the things we're going to do is start looking at the life history diversity of fish in these systems. And the way we'll, we're primarily going to do this is using otoliths. And we're going to reconstruct, we're going to use adult, returning adults. And we can actually go back and reconstruct um, both the, the freshwater history and their, and their marine uh, life history in terms of the number of years, the growth pattern, when they left and um, when they migrated uh, to the marine environment, at what age and what size. And what we want to be able to do is begin to match up the life history diversity with these different thermal regimes. Uh, we're also going to look at features of the eggs in terms of their size um, and um, uh, things like their lipid content, fat content, to see how, mu how, th they, how th they might be adapted to these thermal regimes. 
what we ultimately want to be able to do is to gain some understanding about how the populations in these different streams might be adapted to the various thermal regimes that we have. So, you know, we got here just the two examples. We have 18 Mile and, and, um, uh, and Salmon Creek uh, on here. I'm sorry, 18 Mile and this is 25 Mile. So 25 Mile is this here, this system, uh, 18 Mile. So you can see here is 18 Mile in September and then over the winter and then it begins to warm up. Uh, and this is showing the accumulation of degree days. So look what happened here, fish, you know, fish are spawning out in 18 mile right now. They started a week or so ago. Look what happened. They accumulate a tremendous amount of heat relatively quickly. They need somewhere in the neighborhood of 620 to 720 degrees. Um, you can see they get 400 of that within the first six weeks. And then it gets cold and they don't get anything for a long time when it gets close to zero. You're not, you're not accumulating any heat. Uh, you ever notice why the, it, the fish are spawning later in these groundwater systems? You go out to 25 Mile and uh, Salmon Creek and, and Clear Creek, the fish are tend to be spawning much later into the year. Well, it turns out that if you go, if you look at it, they're accumulating heat the whole time. It's four degrees, three and a half to four degrees every day, so they're sort of accumulating it at a steady rate. And, and it turned out that they're also emerging earlier. Even though they spawn about six weeks later, the fry emerged somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four weeks earlier. And I'll show you some examples here in a second. Uh, the, so when you plateau at, um, in terms of your accumulated days, mm -hmm. the, the animal isn't accumulating for thermal units? No, you, I mean, this is, this is akin to the tortoise and the hare. These guys in 18 Mile, they sort of take off and it's like, ugh, they run out of gas because they don't have... See, so you're at zero. Look how long you're at zero. So it turns out that it, biologically, these groundwater systems are warmer over the course of the year than other surface water systems. When you think about it in terms of heat accumulation. Okay? Um, so the question then becomes how adapted, how, how you know, as, as we see changes in the in, in the thermal regime that might result from climate change, how adaptive or robust might these populations be to those changes? Well, one would say, well, these guys are going to be pretty immune, okay, from 25 miles. The system is going to be pretty immune. But one of our, one, what we're thinking about is, if you, you know, these guys are in a very predictable environment, both in terms of temperature and flows. You know, and the flows are not, not going to go wild in, in, in 25 miles as they will in something like 18 miles. Uh, so one of the things we're thinking about is, well, maybe while this is not very vulnerable to climate change, the population may be quite susceptible because they may not be very diverse. They've sort of evolved in a very stable, predictable environment, as opposed to something like this, which is a vulnerable system, but the populations may be expressing a range of life history types that are going to allow them to meet the challenges of climate change down the road. So that's the type of thing we want to look at. Um, but this, this is really, uh, th this plotting things out in degree days is quite informative. There are a couple things. We're looking at the thermal pattern, but also you notice that the groundwater systems have a very different signature than do the surface water system. So one of the things we're looking at this is, it's really expensive to do monitoring in terms of hydrographs or talking about what, uh, what, what might ha be happening in these different systems. We may be able to do things to just put a $20 thermograph out there and get all kinds of insights about what's going on ecologically in terms of the flow and the temperature and the biological consequences. So we're talking to Forest Service about how to maybe uh, leverage some of this uh, to, to use for their, to their advantage. So just to show you, God, the colors are terrible there. So, um, okay, so this is 18 miles since the colors don't show up very well. And this is 25 miles. And you notice that we, we, I didn't have time to get the earlier data plotted. But one of the things to notice, at a given time, how much larger, in, in fact, statistically, the fish in 25 Mile Creek are actually larger on any given date than the, these are the zero plus fish, the zero plus coho, are statistically significantly larger than the corresponding fish in 18 Mile. Most people would say, well, 18 Mile warmer, so the fish should be growing better. These guys have had a three to four week advantage in terms of growth 
and it looked like they're maintaining that throughout the um, throughout the year. Okay, I mean throughout at least throughout the season. We uh, obviously we didn't get much in September. We're going out there tomorrow to try to get th this information. So again, what is wa what is really warm and what what's cold ecologically here? You know, and, and where where are really the most productive streams? Um, here's just an, another way of looking at it. Here's 25 mile and Salmon Creek, the groundwater system, and we've been looking at fish uh, over the course of the summer. Again, they're larger than any of the other ones, okay? Um, and so it looked like that, you know, th what we're seeing is that we're seeing these fish are, are emerging earlier, getting a jump on the growth and maintaining that throughout the year, even though the, the, the fish from, you know, Hatchery Creek, 18 Mile, um, uh, Martin River, are in warmer environments now, it looked like maybe that three or four week advantage is, is really carrying through. Okay, um, the last part of what we're, we, what we're, we're working on is gonna be changes in precipitation. We haven't, we haven't started this, but um, this is gonna be a key part of what we look at um, uh, going forward because not only are the temperature regimes gonna change as a consequence of um, warmer winters, but the, the hydrograft of these streams are going to change, okay? Because remember, what we're going to see is more likely we're going to see more precipitation falling as rain and less as snow. And now the low flow period in many of these systems is going to be um, during the winter. And what we're going to see, what we, what, what we want to understand is how that might, might change. Uh, we don't have anything, it's very, it's very amazing how few streams we have hydrograft for uh, in Alaska, much less here. You know, where we got seasonal hydrograph, it's really rare. Uh, so just to give you an idea of like, the type of things that um, we're seeing in Oregon, uh, this is a groundwater system. Um, no, th this, is a, 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 this is a system, a, 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 a surface water system um, that is in um, just to the east in the, in the, in the Cascade Range uh, of of, uh, of Oregon. And what, we, what we're seeing is, uh, because of, uh, as a result of warmer winters, we're seeing more variable flows, rainier winters, okay? We're getting higher, uh, more frequent flows during the winter. And then uh, the onset of the low flow period is earlier because we're not storing that precip on the landscape anymore. It's, it, it's going, it's being moved into the systems during the winter and what we see is the onset of the low flow period tends to be earlier in the year. Uh, and, and then we see um, this low flow period extending out a little bit longer. So one of the things we, we want to try to do around here is to try to gain some insight, a potential understanding of what's going to happen if we as we transition from snow to rain in, in these systems. And again, systems like 18 mile, uh, maybe even Power Creek are going to be uh, the ones that are most likely to see the, 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 the early signals of um, this type of, um, uh, of changes. One of the things you can think about, it, so in Power Creek, if we change from snow to rain, you actually may be able to run the, the power plant longer uh, during the year because you're gonna have water available instead of it being low flows during the winter, you may actually have flows where the, where the power plant could operate uh, for a longer period of time. Okay, so what we're, what we're doing is we're looking at this, uh, there's, there's some projections about uh, where this snow to rain transition zone is gonna be. Uh, this is just an example from, um, from down south in Oregon. And what, the, what we're projecting with a two degree warming is we'll go from 3,000 to 4,100 feet. And so what you can do is actually look at a watershed and look how much of the watershed is in this transition zone. And you can have some idea about how significant those changes might be. So if you're in a sort of a mid-elevation um, uh, watershed, you're probably going to see a pretty strong signal from, from, from climate change. If you're in a, a watershed that has lots of high elevation, you may not see that signal. So again, it's this idea of variability. And this is just an example uh, from some work we've been doing. This is the Yakima drainage. Um, these areas in red are ones where we're going to see the biggest change 
uh, in terms of precept from uh, as the flows from it, as a result of changes in the precept. And one of the interesting things to notice: these are reservoirs. This, the, the streams that feed into this reservoir, that watershed is going to be particularly vulnerable. And but notice these other ones; they're not. Okay, and so. One of the key things is about climate change is the expression is going to be really dependent on local conditions. And one of the things that about here is there's tremendous variability and, ver and variety out there. And that may be the key to the delta um, in this area responding to, um, to, you know, to, to any type of, of change that may come as a result of climate change. This is incredible diversity and, and, and variation may be able to uh, absorb uh, any types of changes that we might be coming in the future. Uh, this is just another example of what we're doing with landslides. Uh, you could do the same thing with avalanches, uh, but the idea is that things are going to not be uniformly changed across the landscape. They're going to change uh, depending on locations and vulnerability. And, uh, another thing. So, in, in a nutshell, you know, things are going to change, but it also um, what we expect to happen is, is that the various species are going to be uh, um, different to climate change. And so if we look at, um, at the vulnerability, what we're looking at now is probably where we're going to see the big, some of the biggest changes which will be in Dolly Varden and Cutthroat. They tend to be smaller. They tend to spawn in smaller streams, or, you know, uh, particularly Cutthroat in the spring. These are going to be places they are probably going to see some of the biggest changes happen. On the, uh, on the species, that the, the more uh, economically and ecologically important species around here, coho and pink are probably going to be amongst the, some of the most vulnerable. And the reason being is they have very rigid life history. Okay, you know, although we might be surprised at how that they may not be as rigid as we perceive, but that may limit their ability to respond to, to climate change. So when you're thinking about the vulnerability, it's, gonna, it's going to range, uh, you know, vary quite a bit. Uh, sockeye, Chinook, and Chum are probably, they've got a tremendous life history diversity already in those populations. They probably are going to be well suited moving forward to, to adapt to, um, uh, to, to any type of changes. And finally, Steelhead and Rainbow. And the reason we put these guys over here is because it turns out that these, they're the same species. These are just life history expressions. So maybe that what you're going to see is a decline in, in some of the steelhead populations, but you may, what they may be doing is that population is no longer, you know, for, if steelhead is not a, uh, a, an advantageous life history, you may see that population shift toward the more rainbow type of life history. Um, and we're looking at this real closely. We, I've got a student who actually just showed um, that from steelhead, you can actually, when you mate steelhead, you can actually get steelhead and rainbow life history expressions from steelhead parents. And it's the first time anybody's been able to do that. So um, this is not, these are not separate species, they're just a continuum in terms of life history expressions. Okay, so with that, any comments or questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. You know. With the climate change models, um, uh, going to be warmer, get warmer here. I was under the impression it was supposed to get colder and colder. Well, ag again, I think part of part of what you have to um, to look at is, is the, the the range of predictions is, is, is quite variable. Okay, so there there may be some. You know, I I've gone back. What I use. Let me see here. These are, these projections are from what the SNAP project, which was the, I came, it's out of Fairbanks there. The, it, it's a state funded one. And, and, and they tend to be some of the best around. Everybody I talk to really, you know, says that, that the SNAP has done a, 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 really, a really good job. So I think um, it, it depends on which of these you, which models you use, what the projections are. Uh, what we've been using are what's called ensembles, which is sort of an average of all these different models. Um, and, and they clearly, I mean here, uh, what this is showing is, you, you, is you, the, you're, you're moving into more, whoops, 
this is more rain in the winter and that goes you know that that um, that goes back to uh, to there you know because it, it's also warmer during the winter so um, and of course if the models are wrong if these predictions are wrong you know then you know you, you would expect a different uh, quite a different response but I think the key here is you guys have a tremendous amount of variability and you've got that reservoir I, I think you're going to be quite you will probably do fine no matter what they throw at you you know uh, you know people may not like that it's going to be you know w rainier and, um, during the winters or, or something like that but I think the fish and everything else out there is going to be quite you know they'll they'll do quite fine whether we like it or not Okay. Um, so is there any chance with that, you had the um, slide with the, the graph of their life history and all the months that they go through. Um, is there any chance that their abundance might change because of that decoupling? So if they're either born later or um, they come out of the ground later, is that going to affect like what food's around? Maybe there will be a lot of starvation or well, that, the other way? You know, what we're assuming is that in, in doing this is is that the plants are going to be responding in a similar fashion okay although you know some of the plant stuff is also light dependent so how well the synchronization between the plant and the bug stays is, is another issue okay and then of course there's all kinds of other things you know you're going to have um, if you're looking at things like midges what you're probably going to see are more generations per year potentially of midges instead of having one or two we might be talking three and possibly four um, you know uh, times the midges are producing you think you have no seams now I mean it could be uh, in, you know that that's the type of thing that could could really take off in these ponds or, the, or, or things like that so the, what we looked at here these are adults that these are insects that take one year to complete their life history cycle you know, midges, it's it, it, it like, you know, days. I mean, they, t they turn over really fast. And so if you've got warmer conditions, particularly during this period, you can start to turn over those generations really, really quickly. Um, that might not be a, so much a, a winter story. That might be a, you know, a little bit of warmth in here could really change that. Because remember, these, you know, we're not talking... You know, it, you know, we're talking like 8 to 10 degrees Celsius is, is what the most of these water temperatures are. So even adding a degree or two during that time period, you're talking, you know, somewhere with 20 to 25 percent more heat. And that's the key. I mean, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, we, we'll say, well, it's just a degree or two degrees. And for us, it's not a big deal. Ecologically, that's quite significant, particularly as we go further north. Because we're already, you know, what you're doing is changing the way the, the, the processes that are driving, the developmental processes, the metabolic processes, all kinds of things, are, are dependent upon heat. And what we're doing is accumulating a lot more heat a lot more quickly, even though we, we are saying, oh, it's just a, a degree, or it's just two degrees, okay? For us, it's not a big deal, but for a cold-blooded organism, it is a very big deal. No, we're just um, Gary Lamberti from from the um, from Notre Dame is just starting to explore that in terms of what 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 it means in these ponds in terms of of, of carbon and then you know there's all, you know methane and some other things. So we're just we're just delving into that right now. Okay. When you talk about the difference in the bottoms on the ponds, mm -hmm. just like from the north side of the road to the south side. Would that correlate at all with the stream systems as well? Well, this, you notice on many, yes, exactly. In, in fact, if you look at many of this, you go up like the 18 mile and, oh, I'm trying to think with the other, you know, IBAC and some of the other, particularly if you look in the side channels, this is exactly what you see. And the only reason it's not higher in the water column is that water is not that deep. But this is exactly what you see out there. It's the same, it, it, the same exact thing and whether we get more of it in the, in, in the stream systems or not. And one of the things we're interested in is sort of what is the, 
the biological, ecological consequence of getting more of that. Rob? Groundwater doesn't have any oxygen in it, and they're below glaciers and stuff. So right. Presumably, the oxygen wasn't depleted. Are these like geo geothermal fluids coming out? Why, why isn't there any oxygen in them? You know, I, I honestly don't know. I know all we know is the, the well. You know, you're look you're looking at it from you know uh, glaciers melting and, and adding iron into the ocean and it being a, a, a net plus. This is glaciers melting and adding iron, and it could be a, a, you know a potential negative thing. Um, uh, because one of the things we, we keep wondering about as this collapses this, the, during the fall, is that what really does this make does this become anaerobic over the winter? Um, you know, a combination of the of the plant and this, and that's what really limits that benthic community. Oh, okay, so the groundwater might not be anaerobic. Like well, the ground the, the groundwater itself is anaerobic. We know that. Okay. We know that. Um, and and that's why you get as you come from this anaerobic to that aerobic environment. That's why you're getting that iron precipitating out, right. and then it and it and it's colonized by the bacteria. Um, and so what we don't understand is we, we just are completely baffled by the absence of a benthic component here. Um, you know, you go you go to this pond and it's really well developed. You know, you go to you go to the uplifted marsh pond, it's there in spades. And you've got a, like I say, the structure of these of these uh, assemblages is, is dramatically different from one side of the road to the other. Um, and in in the way those ponds operate, and everybody was blown away by that, and we we didn't expect to find that. You're not seeing a big difference in salinity. It's not a tide water thing. It's not a no, because these I mean these are these are ponds that are literally on one side of the road. There's a, there's some as you go out to the very edge, there is you know there there is a salinity issue. That's a minor one in some of those now. You know, the other thing, and I didn't talk about is, uh, you know, is, is, is sea level rise. And here, you know, you got sea level going up and the delta subsiding. And so you may see sort of the, the effect of, of that may be, you know, the loss of some of the, the, particularly on the edges. That edge may march forward, that salt wedge may march forward. And one of the things you pick up as you go out, you start to pick up some sort of, um, Salt tolerant type of species. There's some very gam some you know gam uh, amphipods and other things you see out on the very edge that you don't tend to see uh, away from that. How is iron affecting the invertebrates? Is there are there lab tests that look at that in a controlled environment? We haven't done anything with it yet, other than to look at it in terms of, of this. Um, Maybe they're they're sensitive to the iron and, and that presence is what's well that yeah we, you know but when you look at the water chemistry of the of the of in in there isn't a lot of iron in the actual water itself okay it's mostly tied up right there areas or the, the hooligan where they spawn yeah. um, we haven't um, we haven't looked at them in terms of well we tried to look at them in terms of their potential contribution as a marine derived nutrient like like the salmon um, but we haven't we haven't really spent a lot of time trying to figure out exactly where they are um, we put a proposal in to do that to uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation but we didn't get funded for it so the hooligan are, you know, it, it, we're trying to figure out, they're a big question mark in this whole thing in terms of what, what, they, what they're doing and, what, and, the, and the overall effect on, this, on these stream systems. 